we're going to continue on this discussion about COVID-19, but welcome another expert to this discussion. And that's going to be someone we know well at the research park, Ken Taylor, but he's in a new role working for the university. And he will be talking about how COVID testing data is being handled in the university and some of his use of cloud computing and other techniques that are allowing a lot of data to be processed quickly. As you just heard, there's testing of students twice a week, in some cases, three times a week. And for staff, we're returning to twice a week now. So there are a lot of tests to keep track of. And Ken will likely share more of the decision tree with each result of how that has to be processed. Now in background, as I said, Ken's no stranger to the research park or the big data summit. He's been a frequent presenter at this event and has done so through a variety of different industry appointments that he's had. Ken is also very active in our user groups. So if you wanna learn more about cloud computing or data science, participate in some of our user groups. And I'm sure you'll learn more from Ken and other peers that like to share their knowledge throughout the research park and with leaders across the industry or other sectors that are, are interested in being part of our community. Welcome, Ken. Thank you, Laura. How's that? Looks great. Thanks, Ken. Okay, great. So yes, um, uh, thanks again for having me. I'm Ken Taylor. I am currently the cloud architect in tech services at the university. And this is going to be a discussion about uh, the COVID testing pipeline that we are putting together as we speak. It's still being worked on. Um, and so we're going to talk about the current process of the uh, testing on campus, uh, how we looked at uh, the pipeline, and some of the challenges we've had along the way. Uh, if you've been on campus and you've had to take a test, it looks like this. You go to one of the testing sites. Here's an open tent uh, on campus and you give your saliva sample after checking in with your university ID card. You take the sample, they put it in a bag and then they take it over to the lab for processing. In the lab, there's a lot of manual work that has to be done to organize the samples. And you see that on the left. Uh, uh, lab tech uh, using a vent hood to take the samples which are in the blue um, uh, capped containers over here, just over her shoulder there. And then on the right, uh, the uh, Quant Studio uh, test environment that's running the PCR analysis on the COVID samples. When you finish the results, and the results are in batches of 384, and here's a grid of what that, that uh, plate or tray looks like. In the 384 samples, there are four control samples, so a maximum of 380 in one tray. Here is a, a multi-component plot of a single sample, and here is uh, all of the samples uh, being uh, uh, projected and, and plotted here. We're, we're looking for an amplification plot that shows a, a gentle upward curve. But of course, you see some of the samples down here that are not uh, uh, abiding by that curve. And therefore, these are going to have uh, um, problems in terms of uh, possibly inconclusive or invalid results. So what does the process look like? Uh, you walk up to the test site, you swipe your ID card, you verify your phone address and name, a label is printed and placed on the tube and you collect your sample in the tube. Once the samples are organized in the lab, uh, the tray is prepared, uh, the assay is performed uh, and it takes about 4.5 hours to get these results. So. Um, and, and I'm glossing over this process extremely quickly here. Um, 4.5 hours means there's a lot of manual organization, um, a lot of checking of the data, um, creation of spreadsheets, uh, uh, transferring the samples from the large tubes to the, to the wells inside the tray, the little tiny samples that go in, into the machine, um, really a tremendous amount of work. Um, but once you do the run of a tray, you have to evaluate whether the system has performed properly or not. So you have to look at those uh, uh, examination of where the machine parameters uh, appropriate, 
and were the results also appropriate? If not, we're going to reject that batch and we're going to probably do it over again. Um, and then once you do have results and the machine has run properly, now I'm going to look at those results for each of those items. And uh, you could get a positive result, a negative result, invalid, inconclusive, or rejected. Um, and all of those results are placed into an Excel file. This is what's known as the initial run. So you take a sample, you do the initial run, and you send that off to McKinley, with, which is our health center here on campus, but you remove the initial positives. And why do we do that? We want to do that because we want to actually verify those positives as being a positive. So we're going to test them again. We're going to take all the positives. We're going to put them in a new tray. We're going to organize them again. We're going to run them through the test, evaluate that test. And if we see a positive for a second time, this is now known as a verified positive. Again, the results are put into an Excel file, and those results are sent along to McKinley. So I've already mentioned the 380 samples in the tray. I've mentioned retesting the positives just to verify that they are positives. Um, but we're also looking at some results that are included in the Excel spreadsheet, and those are the gene values of the virus, um, the S, the N, and the ORF1AB gene. Um, we've also included some new terminology here. So you might be uh, labeled as a positive, infectious positive case. In other words, you have viral load in your system because you tested positive earlier. You've come out of quarantine. You wanna see what your status is after a certain amount of time. You go get tested again, and the viral load is still large enough in your system to be considered infectious. However, you might have tested positive earlier. You went into quarantine. You come out of quarantine. You test again. But now the viral load is far lower in your system, and therefore, you are now considered a non-infectious positive. So here is a very oversimplified diagram of the process in which you go from collecting the samples, organizing them in a tray, creating an Excel file that feeds the analysis machine because we have to tell which of these samples belongs where in the machine. That machine then generates yet another Excel spreadsheet which contains two spreadsheets, one that contains the gene values and another that contains the results. So already we're seeing a problem with data being divided into different groups and we would really like to bring these results together. Meanwhile, we have to send off some results to McKinley. These are the ones that were in the initial run. These are the ones that were in the uh, positive retest run. Plus there are a lot of downstream reports. Everybody wants to know how many positives did we have today? How many of those positives are on campus? How many are off campus? And of course, we are also working with the Champaign-Urbana Public Health District who has to also manage the quarantine of those individuals who are found to be positive each day. Lots of people, lots of people. I cannot, I cannot stress, there are so many people involved in this process from end to end. It is a tremendous amount of work. And what we found is manual processes don't scale, right? We found that on Labor Day weekend because when students were brought back to the campus and some of them didn't exactly adhere to the isolation and, and social distancing norms, um, there were several parties. And from those parties, there were more infectious events. And we went from about 20 positive tests a day to 50, and then 90, and then 100, and then 200, and then another 150. And that, that large number of cases caused a backlog over Labor Day weekend because it's very hard to track down 200 people in one day. And then you get another 100 the next day, and then another 100 the next day. And so this took a long time to clear this backlog. So um, the other problem that we're seeing in, in dealing with the manual process is there are so many people touching these files that we introduce all sorts of typos. People are hand editing the Excel files. They're copying the positives out of the initial file, putting them in another file. Um, you have to scan the label on the test tube. And that scan could easily turn into a duplicate scan if you squeeze that 
trigger twice. And now I've got two records, one after the other. And that means I've offset the location position in the tray by one, the, the position being known as the well position in the tray. Um, I lean on the keyboard. I, I introduce, it, introduce an alphabetical character into a numeric field. Now that becomes messy. Um, all sorts of mismatch of records between Excel worksheets. Um, saving a file that you're working on may overwrite data that you, you wanted to keep. So really the hand manipulation of these files is, is really causing a lot of headaches in the processing. And of course, everyone wants more. There are so many people involved in this process. Everybody wants more data. They want more reports. They want more performance. Where's my data? Why can't I get it now? I want more reliability. I, I want more enhanced information. I want to know everything about this person. Um, uh, where do they live? What floor are they on in campus? Um, and, and so we're trying to merge a lot of uh, uh, separate um, uh, sources of information into the information we're trying to get. And as well, of course, we have to treat it very carefully because this is medical data as well as PII data. And of course, I'll bring up one of our big data nemesis, and that is Excel. Um, uh, my personal rule, don't use Excel. You can use Excel only in the cases where the data sets are very small. However, let's say you're England and you're keeping track of everybody in the country and one of your contractors starts using an older version of Excel which starts truncating the amount of data that you can have in a single spreadsheet. It took them eight days to figure out that they were somehow shy some of their data because these spreadsheets were literally truncating their data. You can go read about it here. We're already doing 10,000 tests a day. So one, we can't be on Excel. We have to move off of Excel into a large scalable system. So we've got to automate. We have to scale this environment up and we have to produce a lot more reports for people because information is the key for us to staying ahead of the COVID problem. So if you signed up, you should have been uh, receiving your uh, big data Magnifying glass, so you can look at this diagram. If not, we'll go into a little bit more detail and we, we can make these slides available as well. But this is the upper half of the pipeline. This is the lower half of the pipeline and we'll, let's go into more detail now. So the pipeline very simply is, starts at the lab, feeds that data into the pipeline where we're managing all of the data. On top of that data, we have to bring in data that the check-in app is collecting when you go to those test check-in sites. Once we get that data and we find some information, we will send it off to McKinley so they can record uh, the, the health information in their database. Plus we have to pull out the new positives, which is very important. We wanna to talk to these people as quickly as possible and as well as a lot of other reports that people are looking for. So with this legend in mind, here is the top of the pipeline. The lab produces some results in a spreadsheet. Humans have to look at that spreadsheet, determine that the run was correct and that the results look correct. If that's true, then we get those initial results followed at some time later by the retest results if there were any positives in that file. If there was a bad run and the machine didn't work, those are discarded and we start over. That information is delivered to Amazon in an S3 bucket. From there, we launch a Lambda function that will convert the Excel files into text. As we move down in the pipeline, we've converted those files into text. We launch another Lambda to help merge all of the other data sources that we're trying to keep track of this individual. So now we have the test results and the uh, information about the individual. We merge that together, put that into yet another location on, on S3. And now it's time to manage the data. And by managing, we have to take a look at especially the positive results. So if we see an initial positive result, we will remove that from the initial file and we send it off to the McKinley database, which is called Medicat. If we get a retest file and it contains a positive result, we're gonna send all of that data also to Medicat. 
However, we will look at the gene values of the repeat positive tests. And we will also make a determination as to whether or not this person is now a non-infectious positive or an infectious positive. The good news is if you're a non-infectious positive, you can return to campus. However, if you continue to be an infectious positive, you cannot return to campus and therefore you have to go back into quarantine. Now, this is the lower half of the pipeline in which we're gonna take all of that data that we just stored and, and, and figured out who's positive, who's not, and we're going to look at just the positives. So we wanna pull these out as fast as possible and, and generate an additional report that we can send off to part of the SHIELD team that is, that is working on all of this processing. But I wanted to point out that anytime we have a database, whether it's the main database that contains all of the testing data, we throw no testing data away, or the, te the testing data that refers to the positives, we wanna feed that off into a, a special reporting environment so that we can do specialized reporting for our downstream consumers. Looking at the test check-in side of things, we have a laptop, you walk up, you swipe your card or you get it scanned. You confirm your uh, name, address and phone number. That information is sent to yet another database and that database is used during the merge operation, which I referred to earlier. We have some older mechanisms in which we were collecting that data, but we've deprecated that in favor of the new uh, test check-in app database. Again, more reports to generate off the check-in. On the McKinley side, once we get results, we put that in a text file and we send it to their secure FTP server. That is picked up and loaded into the Medicat database. From there, there are some additional processes that create other databases. We have the QIR database, which stands for Quarantine, Isolate, and Release Database, which says this is when a person goes into and can come out of quarantine or isolation. We have the Test Compliance Database. This is the database that tells you when your test is coming up, your next test. Those are people who are testing once a week, but there are people such as the undergrad population that's testing twice a week. So here's a little reminder. And then of course, if you are negative, then you can be allowed back on campus. And so this is the allow deny database that actually gives you the, the green light to go back into campus buildings. And again, more databases means more reports. So we've done the top part of the pipeline. Here is the reporting pipeline. Anytime we have a database, we're going to go ahead and scrape that data, throw it into another bucket. But these are typically very small files. We aggregate those files together and we use Athena in Amazon to uh, become a, a SQL gateway so that Tableau can create additional reports and dashboards. And it's very important that we move the data away from the pipeline because we know that the load of reporting is gonna be fairly heavy and we don't want that impacting the processing of the pipeline. So there is the pipeline in a nutshell. But we had a lot of challenges along the way. One of the things that we really needed to do upfront was create a more robust testing environment. We were actually testing the, the pipeline on real lab data. And what we really needed was a lot more cases of dummy data. Uh, we are still in the process of completing our environments, dev, test, and production. And those environments will help isolate developers from production. Um, we need to anticipate support for other groups. Uh, little did we know that we're already testing Greenville University and the University of Illinois Springfield. Those test results do get mingled with the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign results. Um, we have a lot of da data validation that we have to do, all the different data errors that I referred to earlier. And we have a backlog of data that we need to bring into the pipeline so the pipeline is ready to accept new data. Oh, this was a very challenging project for a number of reasons. The size of this project was really amazing. Uh, the number of data sources, the number of people involved, the time it takes to build a consensus. There are so many people involved on campus. It takes a long time. And that time meant 
that requirements were never quite fully baked. And so we would have meetings in which in the morning we would decide on a requirement. By the afternoon, that requirement had been scrapped and we have to start all over again. This makes it very, very difficult to create a software product of any quality when literally the sand is shifting beneath your feet. So we are right in the process of completing the historical data load. We have to run the pipeline and verify it against the manual process. We have to obviously develop more of those reports and dashboards. And we have to think about better information handling. So if we change from a barcode on the label on the test sample to a QR code, we can pack in more information and thus have better uh, data quality as we do that test. Um, I gave this same talk ag again this morning in a, to a different group and they came up with a whole bunch of other questions. Could we link this information directly to uh, your iCard so that when you swipe to go into a building, it would be automatic? I think that's a great idea. Um, can we do contract tracing via GPS? Yes, we could. And we should also be using the security cameras on campus. Um, should we somehow automate the transmission of data from the test machine directly into the pipeline? Yes, we've been talking about that. Um, how about providing the, the viral load samples back to the individual? That has been talked about, but for the moment, mostly because it's happening behind the scenes, we really haven't done it. In addition, we have the community uh, nasal swab tests that are being performed by Carl. Right now, we are building a, a link from Carl directly into McKinley to handle those uh, different tests. So you could actually test on campus and test off of campus. Um, uh, we were asked about retesting uh, negatives to look for false negatives, and, and really we're more worried about the positives. If you're on the borderline of being negative, probably in a day or two you may cross that threshold into a positive, and so we're not going to try and rush that. You should come in regularly and be tested. Um, the discussion of civil, civil liberties versus civic duty, in my opinion, this is a health crisis, and we all have a, our civic duty to mask up and be socially distant and take care of not only ourselves, but of all of our neighbors and our community members. And of course, the first thing that came out of my manager's mouth was this system has to scale. I will not tolerate that you have to tell me you need to take the pipeline down and change it because we ran out of room, we ran out of space. This was the first and most immediate goal of this project. And yes, we are talking about expanding the goal of this system. With that, I thank you. I know that was very rushed, but I wanted to leave some time for questions. There's my contact information there, and I look forward to hearing from folks. Ken, thank you for sharing that. I think it was very interesting for all of us that are on campus. We're experiencing this every day, and it's uh, important to understand how what's happening on the back end. There was a question from an attendee, and I'm, I, if you can see it, you can read it for yourself as well, because I want to track. It has to do with the four control samples that are used to, I think, during the testing process to validate the tests. I don't know if you can speak to that. Um, that may not be your area to address. Uh, yeah, there are um, uh, there are four items, and uh, two of which are control positives, and two are control negatives. So you have multiple. Uh, positives that we're comparing against and multiple negatives. And obviously, um, the both the charting of the negative and the positive controls helps to evaluate that the machine was functioning properly and helps also to calibrate how the other samples are, are performing in that test. So from a scalability standpoint, Ken, I'm looking if there are other questions. You have accolades in the chat, but I'll try to ask a question as well. Um, how have you applied what you learned in the industry side of your work, and you've worked in a number of companies in the research park, to be able to change the way perhaps university researchers might have otherwise approached the scalability issue? Yeah, um, one, just having the ability an experience of working in a cloud environment. Um, it, it's very humbling uh, to find that you're the only one. 
and there might be a handful of other people, but you're constantly bringing in more people. And they're, and the first thing out of their mouths is, I don't know anything about the cloud. I can't do this. And, and that's very disappointing. But it also gives us the opportunity to say to that person, don't worry, we will help you. And, and literally one of, in one of the teams, we took one of their Docker containers and ported it to the cloud in one afternoon and had it running. And all of a sudden, the I don't know anything about the cloud went to, oh, it's pretty much the same thing I was doing before. And, and so we have to break down that barrier and bring people and give them opportunities, not only to learn, but to experiment in the cloud to understand this type of scale. And with that, do you think that there, what type of, of classroom environments should we be pushing to enhance those skills on campus such that this becomes more of the norm of how we train our students to, to fill these roles? Well, you know, part of that is um, uh, we should have our classes in the cloud. Um, we should be, you know, any, anytime someone has to do some homework or some computation, it should be in the cloud. Um, Amazon and the other cloud vendors are making that possibility a reality for students. Um, uh, Amazon has a, a, a big education push. Um, we need to do that not only for the students, but also for the faculty and staff. Um, it, 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 and again, I, I, I cannot stress the number of people who are clamoring for this data. Uh, researchers, faculty, uh, different departments uh, on campus, everybody needs to be able to know, well, wait a minute, you're putting all the data in the cloud. Now, how do I get my data? Right? Mm -hmm. So we're trying to show them, okay, we're going to build you an interface that you just go to this web page and you can look at your data. And we've, we've organized it, we've uh, uh, put the appropriate data governance controls over it so that you're only looking at the data you're allowed to look at. Um, so there's a lot of discussions going on uh, about all of that, all of that machinery behind the curtain, so to speak, of, of dealing with the data in the cloud. I've got some questions coming in. Do you have a couple minutes to take? Sure, go right ahead. Okay. One was about use of Tableau that was mentioned in your diagram and asking if that means we're going to have a new testing dashboard. I think it's using Splunk or some other um, yes. right now. Yeah, I, th I think the short answer is yes, we will have we will have new, different and better, hopefully, dashboards and, and reports coming off of the pipeline. Um, uh, there have been uh, some, you know, there's all sorts of issues going on just all over in the system, whether it's Splunk or the test check-in app, um, connectivity from one group to another. Uh, th these, have been, these have been very, very diff difficult things to overcome. So yeah, occasionally we miss some data in Splunk. The next question I think is a good one. Why did they start with Excel, knowing the inherent scalability problems? Why are you now converting, and should it have been different from the beginning? I would, I yeah. Um, clearly, 380 samples uh, in a in a machine is really no big deal, and therefore, that was the vendor's solution, and and so the vendor produces an Excel spreadsheet and that was fine. And we're like, okay, that's, that's okay. But let's not keep the data in Excel. But you know what happened? Everybody kept the data in Excel and that that's bad. So uh, again, we have to be extremely careful about how we are curating and storing the data set. So um, Excel is a tool that so many people are used to using. They will use it by default. And, and the example in England, it just goes to show that. Okay, last question, and then we're going to break. If there are positives that are retested, I think this is what the question is getting at, and then they are negative, what happens? So yes, if, if you test positive, and then we take that positive test and do another test, um, and you are in the retest, you are considered negative, we consider you negative. Because most likely that first positive test was borderline. And so then retesting it, we can get essentially another view of the data to see whether or not you really were positive or negative. Um, and again, 
there are people looking at these things. This is not an automated system that's saying, oh yeah, you're positive, you're negative. No, th this is, there are human beings who are used to using these machines in a very calibrated fashion who are going, this person's on the border, I don't know. You know, we are, we are using the best judgment possible. We have been talking about making a model that could help evaluate this. It would not be the final say, but it's one of those things where we could assist those evaluators. Great. Well, thank you, Ken. This was great and I really enjoyed it. It seems like from the comments, many other people did too. And it's very real to many of us as, as we've said. So thank you for your hard work. It's important for all of us in the community and on campus. And as this test gets expanded to new locations, developing these scalable best practices. Thanks. Thank you.